Hi, uh, this is Zoe, and this is Ellen, and we are going to talk about why 48 volts is good for you. Um, this is a little bit of an ad hoc and uh, interactive uh, talk, and um, I would like to see how many of you has something to do with electronics, like a hobby level, and oh, that's awesome. So I'm not going to into the terms of uh, AC and DC and what's in the socket. Um, so why is 48 volt good for you? It's an uh, extra low voltage that's uh, specified in standards as below 50 volt AC, 120 volt DC. And the good thing is that uh, under 60 volt DC, uh, you're allowed to touch it. Yeah. It's safe. <laughs> it's safe for you. It's not gonna kill you. you most of the times. Most of the times. <laughs> um, it depends on, on countries, but generally 50 volt uh, requires no certification at all. So if you have a device which uses only 50 volts, um, then you're good to, good to go and um, it's easier to, to create something. And as you know, there's USB and uh, other different DC voltages, 12 volt in cars and such. But um, the limitation is that the lower the voltage, the lower the power, power you get with the same current. So you can either increase current or increase voltage. If you increase current, um, then your losses will increase and by the square of the current. So double the current and four times your losses. And uh, also you need a lot of copper, which is expensive and thick cables and it's very impractical. So why not just increase the voltage? Um, um, so, <coughs> regarding the safety, because uh, earlier it was said that it's safe to touch still, and so the human body resistance, the, well, we're naturally insulated against electricity for a little bit. So it's up to 100 uh, kilo ohms for dry skin, or down to around one kilo ohm for wet or broken skin. For instance, if you have a cut on your finger and uh, you touch um, some electrical outlet, it uh, would be worse than if you have a dry finger with no cut in it. And um, so for the worst case, with 48 volts, uh, with one kilo ohm uh, of uh, resistance, so if you have wet hands and touch your electronics with 48 volts, which I don't know why you would do this, but... Um, <laughs> The Don't. maximum current uh, that would flow would be 48 milliamps. So, uh, and as we'll see a slide later, this um, may cause quite some discomfort, <laughs> but it would not immediately ki kill you. <laughs> and for instance, if uh, you have uh, dry fingers or even protection, so it's completely safe to handle still. And for instance, over 600 volts um, voltages uh, may cause electric breakdown of the skin. So that means that the uh, dielectric breaks down and um, the, the resistance of your skin would uh, decrease rapidly. And that would mean that uh, it's even more fatal above 600 volts. So that's why you have uh, quite a few more uh, fatal accidents with very high voltages uh, than with lower ones. But you shouldn't uh, lick your 48 volt battery packs. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> so here's the um, official chart uh, from the, uh, for the regulations. And as you can see, um, for 50 milliamps, um, you would be still for uh, around half a second uh, in the discomfortable uh, zone, but um, it would be uh, still without uh, permanent uh, damages. And uh, only after that, if you can't pull it or don't want to pull it <laughs> back far, uh, fast enough, it could lead to permanent damage. And so that's, uh, if you get shocked, it, uh, the risk is really, really low, um, even if you handle like uh, very uh, high, volt, uh, very high uh, power uh, with your 48 volt systems. Okay, so um, not now that we know that we are safe, more or less, uh, what can we build with it? And we can uh, use a 48 volt system, DC uh, system, to create um, a local low voltage grid where we connect all our electronics, laptops, computers, 
and uh, we can easily feed electricity from solar panels, wind generators, batteries um, into this local grid because it's mu much easier to feed a DC voltage bus as compared to an AC um, inverter. Um, solar panels are cheap and ubiquitous and they're also DC. So converting between DC and DC is uh, it's quite easy nowadays. And especially um, regarding 48 volts, um, as you know, cars use 12 volts to start the engine and the uh, auxiliary electronics and the headlights and such. But uh, recently, they started to transition to 48 volt. And the reason is because uh, this way they can save uh, the starter and generator, make into one unit, which has like three to five kilowatts of power. Sometimes the car already um, is a hybrid then, so it's better for regula regu regu reg uh, regulatory uh, reasons. Even if you don't really save uh, fuel with it, um, you could save cost and, and weight. And because of the automotive industry, which is quite um, conservative, already pushing to uh, 48 volt, 48 volt converters uh, are becoming more and more uh, easy to, to get. And telecom industry is uh, using 48 volts already since a few years. Um, there are direct converters from 48 volt to CPU V core. So big um, radio transmitters, FPGAs, and, and servers use a 48 volt DC link. And um, at point of load, you don't have to carry the 100 amps the processor needs um, over thick copper, but um, you create your low voltage high current supply uh, locally where you use it. Um, you can build bi bidirectional converters with which um, you can easily feed it back. And if you heard about um, back converter, synchronous back converters are almost trivial to make bi bi bidirectional. And um, a lot of them just easily does it because they, don't e they didn't even consider the designers. So if you have, let's say, a um, 48 volt to 12 volt converter, and you start feeding into the 12 volt end, a voltage higher than 12 volt, and it will try to regulate down to the 12 volt, and by doing so, it will try to sync uh, current from the output and feed it back into your 48 volt uh, grid. This can be a problem if mm, there's nothing on that uh, rail to take this energy, so it will uh, increase the voltage on the rail, and if there's no protection and it's not prepared for it, you can ruin it. But um, the idea behind it is very easy, and it's very hackable. So after you start uh, getting into these kind of uh, power things, um, a lot of possibilities open up for you. Um, let's talk about lithium batteries. And uh, a project we're working on right now uh, uses um, this kind of 48 volt system and battery management system. But um, we were surprised that you cannot really buy a proper um, BMS. So what is a BMS? It, uh, in a lithium battery, there are multiple cells connected in series. And you have to make sure that each of them are in a healthy state. Because if one of them is damaged, or broken, or did discharged, or loses charge, or whatever reason, but the others are still pushing current through it, um, in case of a lithium ion chemistry, this will lead to fire. And you don't, you don't want that. If you heard about the uh, Boeing Dreamliner or Samsung uh, Galaxy Note uh, stories, that's, that's what happened. Yeah, and there's also um, the Chine Chinese uh, lithium batteries, and uh, they have the most amazing brands like <laughs> Surefire, <laughs> Ultrafire, <laughs> and it, so many more. And uh, it's really amazing. You and, know what you buy. Yeah, exactly. You know what you buy. And um, so, and also, 
for testing, it's uh, if you're developing new electronics, it's uh, usually not the best option to go with <laughs> cheap batteries. And uh, if you can not only <laughs> set your electronics on fire, but on your own house too. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> for our project, uh, for, uh, for testing, and uh, we choose lithium iron um, batteries. So, lithium iron phosphate or uh, various other chemistries that build upon it. So, they're really, uh, um, they're unfortunately right now still a bit more expensive, but uh, there's no, and there's absolutely no possibility of thermal runaway, which is really good. And um, compared to all the other um, High energy lithium chemistries. Uh, that's uh, yeah, th that's really good. So, for instance, all the Tesla fires. Or it's, it's, there are so many lithium fires. It's really amazing. And um, yeah, there's um, but uh, there's also lithium and titanate uh, um, oxide, um, which is a chemistry which um, allows for uh, up to. I think uh, 10C, so uh, ten, 10 times... Um, Six minute charge. Yeah, the, uh, 10 times the capacity of the battery can be continuously discharged until it's empty. And up to uh, 10,000 cycles. The downside of those is, of course, uh, that they're more expensive <laughs> and uh, quite a bit less capacity. So you're usually looking at uh, like one fourth of, of the capacity for double the price. So, but another um, upside of those uh, so, is... Uh, so per kilogram and also per liter, your specific energy is, uh, is lower. Yeah. So, um, also one other uh, really cool um, advantage of those is that uh, they go up to, down to minus 55 degrees, some of them. So, even uh, at minus 55 degrees Celsius, you still can get 50% uh, of the capacity out of them. <laughs> And uh, if you know, for instance, other uh, lithium chemistries which go to zero degrees and then uh, gradually drop off and until they don't even work anymore, uh, that's really amazing. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> battery management systems are either really expensive or really bad, and um, sometimes both. Um, we... Huh? Yeah, sorry. Um, for the uh, sometimes both or uh, really. Um, so uh, getting back here, uh, so we went on a trip with our electric skateboards, and of course they have shitty Chinese uh, battery management systems. And we were checking. Okay, it uh, still has uh, two bars out of four, and um, that should work. And yeah, um, sometime on the way back, uh, the battery just died. <laughs> And because you don't have any real charge management with them, it's just uh, it's a rule of thumb, and uh, you can't really tell how full or empty the batteries are with them. So Lit um, problem with lithium battery charge estimation that they are very flat. So just measuring the voltage on them doesn't really tell you any information how full they are. And if you see your smartphone on your laptop and it's telling you 76%, that's because it has a column counter. It measures how much how many charge went into the battery and how much goes out of it because there is really not much leakage. So what goes in comes out. And so we can estimate much more uh, accurately, but this is a, a trickier setup. And the the naive approach just measure the voltage and um, go with it. That's like uh, you have a very big uh, pan and you try to estimate how much water is in it. And if it's one millimeter or two, there is maybe ten liter or twenty. So it's very hard to estimate uh, the amount of water based on the the height because it's it's big. And that's how you can imagine lithium batteries and charge estimation. Um, so we are building this 48-volt uh, system and 48-volt uh, converter. How can you get rid of energy? How can you load your, uh, your t device? Um, there we go. <laughs> we bought plenty of uh, old school 12 volt halogen lamps, um, the very inefficient ones. <laughs> These are 50 watt each uh, from 12 volts and we connected them in series. We're making a big array of uh, 100, so two times 50 uh, in each module because I have to sync two and a half kilowatts. Um, 
for <laughs> it's also very good in the winter if you, if you're cold but um it has a beautiful glow so um this is very very fresh this is actually from yesterday uh I think it didn't day before. Yeah, yesterday. I think <laughs> yesterday. So this is a very uh, fresh in development, and why um, I don't feel bad for um, talking about this because it's open hardware, and you can. And when we are finished with it, we tested it, and you can buy from us, test it, or you can just get the schematics and uh, build it for yourself. Also, the firmware. Um, because uh, just one, one more second. So the the BMS, I want would like to know the performance of each cell in a big battery pack because maybe you get one bad cell and which one to to swap to uh, keep the whole pack working. So you need some kind of communication interface, and you cannot, you really cannot buy uh, even for for high like. You have to pay. Uh, you have to pay like thousand euros for an automotive grade battery management system with which you can talk over CAN, and then you're still not sure how well it's firmware is written and or how accurate it is, <coughs> because the the BMS you buy uh, from China on AliExpress, they just promise that they will balance uh, the cells and maybe have some shutdown, but that's it. And you either believe them that uh, they are accurate or you don't, but there is no way, not really no way to prove it because you have no data. Um. <laughs> yeah, the moth. <laughs> <laughs> so, what next? Uh, so everything is open hardware, safe to hack, and we are trying to make some kind of a knowledge base and. Um, now just change about power electronics, because the revolution that happened with Arduino and making microcontrollers accessible haven't happened yet with power electronics. We all have our power brakes and uh, USB chargers and all kinds of uh, DC supplies. And like, why do I have to carry so, so many different uh, supplies around? And this is what the promise of USB-C and power delivery uh, was, that one charger works with everything. But the problem is that they abstracted away too much, so you don't have a, an influence. You don't really have an influence on w the power flow and like, what do you want to do? Do we have a power bank here and a laptop? And which direction do you want now to be uh, charged? Or like more tricky when you connect your your big smartphone and your energy efficient laptop, and then it's not really uh, easy to tell. Do you want the phone to be charged or the laptop to be charged? And this is totally missing uh, from the current ecosystem, software and hardware ecosystem. And maybe we can help build this, make this happen. And um, most importantly, um, all of those projects uh, we're working on right now, it's, uh, it uh, came out of the need because we wanted them all, all those things. We wanted them ourselves and we saw, OK, nothing like this exists so let's start building something and uh, that's our goal and to build uh, electronics to make uh, power hacking easier and yeah the best way is to start with something that's really usable in practice like uh, you shouldn't just be able to get some things and use them and be happy with them and also without a really high expert level of uh, the internal workings of battery management systems and everything you should be working uh, you sh should be able to just uh, create new things and uh, to hack on new things and all of this with something that's uh, safe to use if you handle this and if you don't have, for instance, if you didn't get the proper instructions or uh, if you don't have the proper knowledge, it shouldn't still be safe um, to use all those things and uh, with, with little care. And there are, of course, uh, lots of, um, for instance, stuff for 230 volts, and, uh, but it's, there's also so much risk associated with it and we just want to make something that's really easy to use. Questions? Yes. What do I have to do to convert my own from solar and wind power or to solar and wind power running on 48 volts with some batteries? 
what is missing? What do I have to, to work on? Or what do I have to do for combating my own house, my whole, whole house? Mm, the tricky things are all the, all the high power things like washing machine and and all the electric uh, cooker, uh, water kettle, um, electric oven, these kind of things. These are very tricky to uh, to supply because they draw significant amount of current even from 230 volts, like a 10 kilowatt uh, oven. That's that's beefy to run from 48 volts, but um, if if that runs, if it runs from gas, your oven, then it should be relatively uh, straightforward. So I come from the, I just covered everything from gas to electricity within the next three years by law. Wow. Yeah. Well, um... Like 100 amps are 4.8 kilowatts. Uh, 200 amps you need for 10-ish uh, kilowatts. It's a thick copper cable. It's a thick copper cable, but it's doable. Mm, you're going to need converters to to have like a stable 48 volt uh, bus, and your solar and everything feeds into it, and. You, the battery is connected to it, and they also have to talk to each other. So like, oh, um, the charge level in the battery is this much, and we have solar energy available, so let's like fill into the battery, and so on. But it's, it's really tricky to go off-grid, and um, the economics of it are still like very hard to tell if it's a good idea. Uh huh. Yeah, you can do something like that. And uh, we're going to put links and uh, like I have a few part numbers if you want to build stuff for yourself because we found a few ICs we are working with right now and also we are going to share some of the designs and um, proceedings. You just. Uh, Uh, how much one amp you can run? Like two? Amp? So, um, over Ethernet cables would be um, quite a challenge because. Uh, Does it not be it for current? They don't contain much copper. <laughs> but someone, like, someone converted a circular saw to power over Ethernet. Yeah, a table saw. A table saw to run from power over Ethernet. <laughs> More questions? Oh, it's an awesome project, and also great that you do it the open source way. And I hope that a lot of people will follow you and that you together make a big project and a lot of people can have some fun with it. If you're coming to uh, CC Camp, uh, then we're going to have a prototype there. Yes, yeah. there is, there is, there was a forty-eight volt mini grid. Yeah, forty-two, 42 volt. volt. And um, unfortunately, uh, for instance, uh, the alt power project. Um, I think unfortunately they lost their wiki, uh, and uh, recently, but, and so I think they're only rebuilding the documentation right now. And um, yeah, for CCC camp, uh, we are trying to. Um, Bring some, bring our prototypes, and uh, we also talked with other people who who will bring some solar panels and stuff. And uh, basically, if we have enough working hardware there, uh, we'll try to set up a mini grid. And otherwise, it uh, there will at least be uh, a networking event and to see how um, we can yeah we can build something bigger uh, with all of this. The problem with big PC internet power grids. I'm not really talking at this level, it's no problem, but the, the bigger levels is when you mesh with the cables, yeah, you can't control the power flow. And the real and the AC grid, there are special transformers to control the power flow over the, the meshed copper network. And in, in DC, it's 
not that possible. I only know uh, projects of going on with the University of Spain. Um, they develop kind of uh, network for power flow in the, in the DC grid. But um, AC is um, uh, extremely easy to control the power flow or mesh the couple network. But at the scale of grid, or a little power, no, uh, it's no problem. I think it works better if you have a side channel for communication. It works better if you have a side channel for communication yeah, between the nodes. With the, with the DC lines, uh, with, the, with the nodes, uh, mm -hmm. and, and um, increasing sync the, the voltage levels. To uh, not, not, not burn one cup of wire. Yeah, it's uh, like this 48 volt system is, is for local. Yeah. It makes sense. Okay.